I'll be talking probably for about 45 minutes, 40, 45 minutes, and then we'll take 15, 10, 15 minutes for discussion at the end. But if you have questions during the presentation, feel free to stop me, interrupt me, and just raise your hand. So um, this is a project that we've done uh, for the past two years, and these are the co-authors, uh, co co-researchers. I want to acknowledge Donna Lane, who's a geneticist here, uh, Betsy Benson, who's on our faculty, Susan Hammerkamp, who's on the Nice Hunger faculty, uh, Murugu Manikam is a geneticist uh, here at OSU, uh, Suzanne Davis is a research assistant that worked with us, and Patricia Navas is a postdoc from University of Salamanca who helped us uh, with the data analysis and the report. So you should have a copy of this brief report. Um, I think every DD topic should have a nice glossy report. <laughs> um, we just had this brief report done mainly for the funder and for the participants who will receive a copy of the report. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about um, the study. This is the first time we're presenting these data. So I might be finished in 10 minutes, or I might be finished in an hour and 15 minutes. But uh, nonetheless, we'll stop around a quarter till, 10 till, and um, just spend the last 10, 15 minutes for discussion of questions. We want to acknowledge the funding from the Columbus Foundation, but also our partners, the SACO, Down Syndrome Association of Central Ohio, Down Syndrome Achieves, as well as Franklin County Board of DD, who helped us predominantly um, with the heavy lifting of the recruitment of our sample and our getting the word out of our study. <clears throat> so why did we do this? We did this because person with, persons with intellectual and developmental disabilities experience worse health outcomes than the general population. There seems to be growing literature around this. Um, in 2002, the US Surgeon General, then David Satcher, published an exhaustive report which essentially concluded in people with ID, their families, and their advocates report exceptional challenges in staying healthy and getting appropriate health services when they are sick. They feel excluded from public campaigns, so health promotion, um, to promote wellness. They describe shortages of healthcare professionals who are willing to accept them as patients and who know how to meet their specialized needs. And that, uh, that's confirmed by a study that was done by Special Olympics uh, and published in 2005 where they surveyed families who on average reported having to contact 50 physicians or more before they found a physician, a primary care physician, who had been trained and was uh, knowledgeable about disabilities. <clears throat> so the point of this study is sort of twofold or two-pronged. The first one was a survey. We wanted to survey um, approximately 300 adults with Down syndrome and their families about their health character, about their health status. How are they? Are they healthy? How do they feel? Um, how do they uh, access services? Do they have a primary care physician? Do they see a dentist? Do the women see gynecologists? Do the men see uh, other specialists, urologists? Do um, uh, what do they report in terms of health conditions, secondary health conditions, and so forth? And then the second prong of the study <clears throat> was uh, we wanted to invite um, a subset of those individuals to the adult Down syndrome clinic that we have here at Ohio State for a physical. And so they came in to the clinic and they did, we took height, weight, um, hip, uh, waist circumference ratio. We also did blood draw, so we did genetic uh, DNA uh, analysis. We also looked at gluc blood glucose, triglycerides, cholesterol, blood pressure. <clears throat> and what was interesting about that is one of the things that we wanted to do, sort of as a collateral benefit, was we wanted to compare some of these uh, metrics that we got in the clinic with what uh, our sample, online sample, was reporting in terms of height, weight, BMI, and some of the other characteristics. I'll just get a sense of <clears throat> whether or not those statistics or those percentages were comparable which I think. Um, so I'll pre first present the online survey. Um, and what we were looking at is uh, whether or not adults with Down syndrome were more likely to be overweight and obese. That seems to be common in the literature. Um, 
and whether or not they would have more secondary health problems um, uh, than adults from the general population. Being overweight, we know, is a major risk factor for a lot of secondary health conditions, such as heart disease, diabetes, arthritis, sleep apnea, and so forth. Uh, being overweight also exacer exacerbates other health problems like high blood pressure, cholesterol, uh, blood glucose, sleep apnea, etc. So we want to look at these different um, health conditions. Before I start, you all know Down syndrome, the most common genetic uh, condition associated with intellectual disability. Um, Depending on the statistic, it's about 1 in 700 births. Um, despite a lot of prenatal screening, which a lot of people thought would uh, reduce or impact significantly the prevalence, it hasn't, it doesn't, doesn't seem to have impacted the prevalence uh, significantly. What's interesting though, those of you who are interested in autism, when you look at NIH funding for research in autism, it's about tenfold the NIH funding for Down syndrome. But when you think about the um, staying power of Down syndrome, we've, you know, we've been studying Down syndrome for decades and decades, and the prevalence is still relatively important. Uh, and obviously the impact is critical. And there's some interesting factors that we see in, in the health research um, and some of the stuff we wanted to take a peek at, which relates to things like leukemia and solid mass tumors, where people with trisomy 21 seem to have a different uh, rate of prevalence than the general population. They seem to be more susceptible to leukemia type cancers, and they seem to be less susceptible to develop solid mass tumors. Other interesting health factors, obviously, is around the more well-known dementia and Alzheimer type dementia, which seems to be much more common in people with Down syndrome than in the general population. Although, although it seems that most um, brains of adults with Down syndrome have been by uh, autopsy or uh, analyzed. They have the amyloid plaques. Not all of them have the clinical features of dementia and Alzheimer's type. Uh, and you'll see some of the statistics of the prevalence that we had in our study. <clears throat> and the other thing, um, just in terms of background or history, you know that Down syndrome was, it's called Down syndrome because Langdon Down described it in the 1800s, but actually trisomy 21 was first described by Jérôme Lejeune, a French geneticist, uh, recently in the 1950s, 1960, 1959. Um, which is interesting, because when you go to France, they don't call it Down syndrome, they call it trisomy 21. <laughs> I'm sure when you go to London and England, they call it Down syndrome. So the purpose of the study was to look at these adults um, and look at who have these uh, special health care needs. So we developed a survey which we administered between July of 2011 and May 2013 on adults predominantly in Ohio, although we had some people, we had one person from LA, uh, we had other people from other states, uh, and I think that was really to be in the hunt for the we. PlayStation that we were raffling off amongst the participants <laughs> of the people. The guy from uh, LA was excluded from the sample altogether. Um, so what we wanted to look at in terms of the survey was current physical and mental behavior problems, frequency of health screenings, routine health screenings, what were their healthy behaviors, and what was their access to healthcare services in the community. Um, then we also want to look at uh, our questions were, what is the general health of adults with Down syndrome? Are there any unmet health care needs? And uh, are there any access issues? And as Susan mentioned, a lot of this also leads to some interesting uh, discussion and ideas around training, training of health care professionals, nurses, physicians, and so forth, uh, in terms of uh, accessibility of services in the community. So we had a sample of about 291 adults. Um, predominantly, the survey was completed by the parent of an adult uh, in 70% of the cases. In about 23% of the other cases, it was either a sibling, direct support staff, or other. And in 7% of the cases, it was actually the adult, him or herself, with Down syndrome who completed the survey. The mean age 
which those of you who are familiar with um, life expectancy of people with Down syndrome, we know it's significantly increased in the last couple of decades. So we had a range from 18 to 79. We actually had a 79-year-old. Um, I'm sure somebody's going to ask me, did he or she have a diagnosis of dementia? But um, average age was 33, uh, standard deviation was about 13 years. Predominantly, these adults are living with their parents, their family, predominantly 71%. This is the <clears throat> distribution in terms of level of intellectual disability. The majority have uh, what we would call moderate intellectual disability, 65%. 20% have mild intellectual disability. Distribution, male, female, was uh, slightly uh, more men than women. And the type of <clears throat> Down syndrome, as you may know, there's uh, different types of Down syndrome, or trisomy 21. 20% didn't know, so didn't report, or reported not knowing. Of those who knew, or the remaining, I should say, and th these proportions resemble what we expect in the population, so about 2% <clears throat> are uh, mosaicism and about 4% were translocation and the, ma the vast majority were uh, traditional trisomy 21. So this is the age distribution. We have a little bit of a, a skewed uh, curve here. But what's interesting, I think, to look at is that we do have a lot of elderly adults with Down syndrome. Uh, uh, well into their 50s and 60s. Any questions so far? How do we calculate the range? <laughs> All right. Body mass index. So we were interested in weight, body mass index being one indicator of uh, obesity. <clears throat> I'm not sure if this is the way I like how we should present this, but this is how I'm presenting it for today. So. Uh, if you, if you look at here, uh, the vast majority, not the vast majority, I shouldn't say that, but almost 50% of our sample is in the obese range when you look at BMI, body mass index, which is over 30. That's the, the definition of obesity. <clears throat> and when you combine overweight and obese, the Down syndrome population is substantially higher in terms of overweight and obese uh, compared to what we know of the general population. Uh, fewer, obviously fewer are in the healthy weight than the general population and fewer in, in the underweight based on BMI. Interestingly, despite having a BMI in the obese, obese range, obese range, 70% of those adults report considering their eating habits good, very good, or excellent, which is interesting. Any ideas on that? Is the perception wrong, you think? How did they define eating well in the question? Was it balanced meal, vegetables, or just milk? It's the same question we have in the NCI, isn't it? There are the national court indicators. I think it's a generic kind of uh, self-appreciation without any, without, without any, uh, we don't have, to, we didn't have the pyramid or yeah, the food plate. Okay. Didn't have the food <laughs> yeah. plate. Um, so we just said, you know, how would you rate your eating habits? And, and the we didn't have Big Macs next to the chart. <laughs> <laughs> would have been parents and caregivers. Predominantly, yeah, it would have been 70% parents um, giving us the information about their height weight, but also giving us the information about their um, eating habits. In all cases, they were encouraged to do the survey together, but predominantly it was the parent filling out. So we're not clear whether this is <clears throat> their perception being uh, kind of like um, warped, or maybe they are eating well, but maybe their metabolism is slower, and maybe that because isn't there like a high incidence of hypothyroidism yes. and Down syndrome? So maybe they are okay, healthy as they perceive, but there are other factors that are playing into it. Uh, exactly. So we don't know yet. So there could be other factors. Maybe they are eating well. <clears throat> uh, 
but uh, because of other metabolic or other reasons, they are uh, accumulating uh, body fat. You know, there's some theory, Susan, feel, feel free to jump in, about whether obesity is, is a, a genetic, is genetically driven or, or kind of lifestyle driven, or what's the, the balance between that? So it's, I think it's certainly interesting. Um, <clears throat> other health conditions, so in looking at other health conditions, as you said, hypothyroidism is the big one in terms of co-occurrence. But before I get to that, I want to talk about <clears throat> co-occurring autism. We had 17% of our sample of adults with Down syndrome. And that's funny because, you know, 20 years ago, we never talked about um, Down syndrome and autism. But now we, we beginning, we're beginning to see a lot more reports and literature of people with Down syndrome, more with Down syndrome, who also develop autism. <clears throat> so in our sample, we had 50 out of 291 who reported having a co-occurring diagnosis of autism. And 88%, 88% had at least one secondary health condition. So clearly there's other health issues going on. In terms of the other health conditions, I'm going to this, I'm going to pull this up into the next chart. So hypothyroidism, uh, very high, 30, 34% had type, reported hypothyroidism. Uh, skin conditions are very prevalent, like dry skin, uh, scaly skin, um, allergies, but sleep apnea, which is often related to weight, but also people with Down syndrome have uh, different features. More speech people can maybe speak to those issues. Tongue, size of their tongue, and they have a lot of hypo, uh, uh, low muscle tone. <clears throat> Other health issues, <coughs> uh, vision, uh, GI, diabetes, interestingly, was not as high as we would have thought. Not as high as we would have thought. Uh, and other health related. The other one that we were really interested in is celiac disease, and I'll come back to that in a minute. Any questions about the health? So when you look at our study, the prevalence of hypothyroidism compared to the general population, substantially higher, substantially higher than people with Down syndrome. Sleep apnea, also substantially higher in this population, <clears throat> and often underreported uh, in, in, our, in our sample, or in people with uh, Down syndrome. And here diabetes is lower than what we uh, have reported in the general population for adults age 20 and older. <coughs> Are these general population numbers coming from a nationally representative sample? Yes. Yes. Good question. So either CDC or other large-scale studies. How representative do you think your sample is of the general uh, Down syndrome population? It's a self-selected sample. Um, we begged and pleaded everybody. Uh, <laughs> um, it's hard to say, um, but it's it's a fairly decent number considering we're just talking about Ohio. Uh, but you never know. It's, it's still rep self self selected sample. Um, in terms of the online survey, I would I will I will say that I think this sample is more representative of the, the overall Down syndrome population that may be our clinic sample, because our clinic sample was largely driven by um, either they knew the clinic and they've been coming to the clinic or they wanted to get a physical, they needed a physical, or they lived close by because the driving was an issue, whereas the online was less of an issue. Now you could argue that maybe technology was a barrier for some people with Down syndrome, um, you know, the digital divide. Um, good question. Is this type 1 and type 2 diabetes? This is um, both combined in this case. The question was just diabetes or type 2. <clears throat> All right. Um, access to health care, this was good news for us because we thought that a lot of these adults would not have a primary care physician or primary care provider 
But 95% of them said they did have a primary care physician. 83% of them reported having had a physical in the last year, which is pretty good. <coughs> Probably 83% of us had a physical in the last year. 86% um, even more surprising, when we have to tell Tim follow up, 86% had seen a dentist in the last year. A lot of people with Down syndrome have dental issues, but often they also have a lot of challenges in finding a dentist in the community. <clears throat> and their perceived um, well-being or, or health uh, was very good or excellent in 51% of the cases. So generally they're feeling pretty good about their health. Other types of specialists that they're seeing in, in the community, ophthalmology, optometry was the most common reported, 46%. Podiatry, feet problems, not, not uh, surprising. Audiology, how many of you know audiology? audiology? Any podiatry people in our land? No. Um, dermatology, which is consistent with um, secondary conditions. Gynecology, urology, 18%, neurology, 15%. So these are the specialists. And this is, for us, is really interesting information as we plan and think about healthcare transition and what are the specialists that we need to think of having assembled in a, in a healthcare transition clinic. So this is at least for people with Down syndrome. It may be a different um, selection of specialists for other types of disabilities. Maybe it's different for people with autism or maybe people with Williams. Cancer rates. We were interested in looking at cancer rates. <clears throat> 14 of our sample reporting had reported having had cancer at some point in their life, um, which represents 5% of our total sample, which is comparable to the overall sample. But when you look at the cancer, Half of those individuals reported that their cancer was leukemia. Uh, so they had, had leukemia as uh, younger. Uh, and the other 7%, it was uh, a different type of cancer that they had been diagnosed with. So that, that is interesting and, uh, for us. Uh, an area I think that we'd like to sort of dig deeper in, in this area of cancer and, and cancer study of people with Down syndrome. <coughs> Interestingly, in terms of cancer screening, and this is a bit of a busy slide, so when you look at mammograms for women, um, they should be getting mammograms um, after 40 every two years. Have I got that right? After 40 every two years. So when we look at our sample, of out of our total sample of 137 women, we have 34 women over 40. Of those, 78% uh, had had a mammogram in the last two years. Six had never had a mammogram at all, and three didn't tell. Uh, in terms of pap test, uh, what's recommended is uh, after the age of 21, every three years having a pap test. But if you look at our sample here, Approximately 40% of our sample of Down syndrome had a PAP test um, versus 83% of the general population as reported by uh, the American Cancer Society. Now, in terms of the PAP, you might say, well, if they're not sexually active, should they be getting it? Do they need to get a PAP test? That's, I think that's a good question. But these are routine cancer screens. Uh, and the, the, the question we wanted to see is, are they getting done? So every one of them, pretty much, almost everyone has a primary care physician. And you recall more than 90% had had a physical uh, in the last year, so they're probably seeing their physicians routinely, regularly, but the question is, is are they doing what we would expect them to do as they would do with the general population? <clears throat> Prostate for men, looking at PSA again, there's a lot of variance in the recommendations for prostate cancer screening, but we looked at PSA. We didn't ask about digital uh, exam for the men. But looking at our men, out of the 154, we had 19 men in our sample over 50. Of them, 
only 31% had had a PSA test done in the last year. Three of them didn't know, and five, another 31% had never had a PSA test done ever. So here seems to be some indication that maybe the men are not getting at least through PSA, which is a lot less invasive, a lot less intrusive um, form of uh, prostate cancer screening. Um, many of them are not getting it. <clears throat> Health-related behaviors. Only two uh, individuals in our sam sample smoked or chewed <coughs> tobacco. I guess uh, when I was in North Carolina, it would have been a lot higher chewing tobacco. Um, but very few of them are engaged in these unhealthy behaviors in terms of smoking. Uh, and I think the statistic was comparable for drinking alcohol. Not that high, not as high. What do you make of that? Do you think that's self-determination? They choose not to drink and smoke? Or do you think they're just told not to have access? They don't have access. Most of them live with their parents, too, right? Yeah, more than 70% live with their parents. So I think that's one question is, <clears throat> is it choice or is it, you know, access, choice driven by lack of access, so to speak. Um, engaging in moderate physical activity. My joke is always, when you look at these activity levels for people with Down syndrome, very often, number one is bowling, number two is walking, and so it's walking to the bowling alley, or walking to the down, down, down the lane. Uh, but those are often the two top um, activity, physical activities, unless they're very engaged in Special Olympics, in which case they may be doing more basketball or track and other kind of thing. <coughs> but, um, but in terms of activity level, it uh, probably could be better uh, in terms of uh, activity level. Health-related behaviors, so this is sort of the, uh, uh, activities of daily living, and these are used almost as proxies for physical activity because a lot of these <coughs> like vacuuming is a, is a way of being physically active or engaged. <coughs> but a lot of these are not related. A lot of these speak more to adaptive skills, um, but looking at the ones that are more physically engaging, like making their bed, doing household chores, running errands, uh, doing laundry, um, setting clearing table, um, washing dishes. So um, 70, 60, 70% 70 of the sample are engaged in a lot of these uh, physically active chores, um, not necessarily on a daily, uh, despite the name, but uh, on a regular uh, routine, and many of them independently or with help. Um, so this is, these are good. Psychiatric and behavioral health. <clears throat> so in terms of self-reported, overall 21% of them reported having some type of formal psychiatric uh, diagnosis, which is slightly lower than what we would typically expect in a sample of people with developmental disabilities. We often see in the literature somewhere between 30 to 40%, but 21% is not that off. Uh, <clears throat> the most prevalent Depression, does that surprise you? No? <coughs> yes? Well, you kind of have that uh, stereotype of people with Down syndrome being happy and friendly and outgoing, which doesn't sit with the typical depressive disorder. Any others? I, I agree with that. The, the kind of the stereotype view we have of Kids and adults with Down syndrome are always kind of smiling and happy. <clears throat> Depression, 12%. Uh, Alzheimer dementia, 5.8%. Both of them substantial. Both of them higher than the general population. So I think depression is maybe one in nine in the general population, so less than 10%. So higher prevalence of depression, co-occurring depression, and Down syndrome in our sample. And I think often this gets overdiagnosed, especially when they start getting 35, 40, when in fact it's depression, and depression is underdiagnosed. But it often mimics a lot of these change in thoughts and change in personality, 
and we have a tendency, because everybody knows about Alzheimer's and Down syndrome, to overdiagnose. I'm not saying that 5.8 is overdiagnosing, but I think this is definitely underdiagnosed. I'm happy to be argued down on that point. Anybody disagree? Susan? So, I mean, I don't, I don't have any statistics, but I, I know that that's often um, talked about in terms of, um, as you say, we have a tendency of thinking people who are, have Down syndrome are typically happy and not depressed. And it seems like everybody's getting a diagnosis of dementia when they don't necessarily have all the clinical features of Alzheimer type dementia in their 30s and 40s. <coughs> All right, um, let me just go quickly through some of our physical characteristics. And um, so when we look at our physical sample, we actually had 35 people come in for our physical. Um, we had hoped to get 50, um, but despite our uh, very um, lucrative incentives, or not, but, uh, we, uh, what, what I think uh, struck fear into a lot of people was the blood flow. A lot of them uh, didn't want to get uh, their blood drawn. And actually, of the 35, three, I'll use this expression with affection, three weaseled out of the blood draw because we <laughs> only have uh, blood draw data on uh, 32 of our 35. Uh, but we have all the, the other physical uh, health metrics uh, on all 35. So the mean was 31. Average uh, standard deviation was 10. The range was. Um, slightly younger overall. Uh, even balance, uh, again, slightly more men than women. Uh, this is sort of the age distribution of our physical. So kind of a good spread across the age. A little bump up here, maybe because the physical or the exam, uh, a lot of these people wanted to have a uh, health screen or health exam uh, more than the younger people, I don't know. Um, obesity, comparable to our online survey, 46%. We had 40, 49%. Um, so when you look at both combined, 75% uh, are in the overweight obese range. Uh, when you look at body mass index, um, and we also did um, waist-hip ratio. Anybody know why we would do hip-waist ratio? <coughs> Possibly to see where the fat accumulation is. Yeah, so there's a, it's supposed to be another indicator of, of obesity, maybe perhaps different indicator of where the, the weight is or the <coughs> fat is. Um, maybe more um, typical for people with Down syndrome to have that distribution there. Uh, so when you look at the hip, uh, the waist hip ratio, the CDC says that men should be uh, under 0.9 and women should be under 0.8. I know it's unfair, uh, but that's what they <laughs> say. Um, to be safe or recommended. I don't know if it's safe, I can never die, but uh, health-wise. In our sample, 50% of the men and almost 60% of the women uh, had a uh, waist-hip ratio above that uh, recommended uh, ratio. So based on this metric, uh, we had more overweight obese, if you will, uh, if I can use that uh, loosely, uh, in terms of uh, weight and height. <clears throat> Again, in terms of health conditions, so these are health conditions that uh, we got at our physical, so either through medical records or diagnosed. Uh, again, hypothyroidism is the high one heart condition. Often that's a history. It's, it's not uncommon with people with Down syndrome. Hearing problems, sleep apnea, skin problems, a lot of the same ones that we saw uh, earlier. Um, again, our celiac is down here. There are two. What's interesting, and I think if Marugu were here, he would get real excited about this, is um, there's a, there's a, um, who's Patricia? Help me out, Patricia. So there's a, there's a screen for alleles for celiac disease. And if, you're, if the alleles are permissive for celiac disease, you're more likely to develop it. And if the alleles on the analysis are not permissive, you're not likely to develop it. Now, we don't have many people, but in the two 
that were diagnosed with celiac disease, both of them had permissive alleles. So indicating that what's, uh, what's seen in the general population may also be a predictor of celiac or developing celiac disease in people with Down syndrome. Did I get that right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <clears throat> All right, I'm almost done. So here, here's the blood work. So we had blood work on um, 32 of the 35. So we looked at triglyceride, cholesterol, thinking that if they have o overweight or obese or if they have weight problems, and if they're underactive, if they're not engaged and if they're eating poorly, uh, we would expect them to have high triglycerides and high cholesterol. Interestingly, it is high, but not that high. Um, so 25% of our sample had triglyceride levels that exceeded um, sort of the high level. Uh, 11 or 34% had cholesterol levels that were borderline or high, but mostly in the borderline range. Uh, all of them, or the majority of them that did have high triglyceride and high cholesterol did have uh, overweight or obese uh, uh, weight levels. Uh, so it definitely seems to be an indicator, but there's a lot of people in our sample who are overweight and obese who don't have high triglycerides and high um, cholesterol and high diabetes, and that's interesting. And hard, any heart disease. And hardly, not as much heart disease as you would expect, like uh, acquired heart disease. Obviously, many of them are born with some congenital right. heart defect, and often that gets corrected, but not heart disease. Good observation. <clears throat> Again, so we had, uh, looking at glucose, only one out of 32 had a uh, glucose level in this borderline or pre-diabetes range. None were very high. And I forget, I'm looking at Patricia or Susan, I forget, but I don't think many of them had a diagnosis of diabetes. Am I wrong? Do we know? Um, so they came in and we looked at blood, blood glucose, uh, but very few of them had or were on uh, insulin or any type of uh, diabetes uh, medication. And of those tested, only one in 32 had kind of this pre-diabetic level of blood glucose. PSA, none of them had a high PSA <coughs> in our sample of 18 men. All right, so in summary, uh, so we know that people with Down syndrome experience worse health outcomes than typically developing peers. Uh, rates of obesity are high. Uh, we know that they have, we, we see in our sample, and we know that they have high rates of hypothyroidism, which looks a lot like depression, too, when, you, when you're familiar with hypothyroidism, if it's not well controlled or medicated. Skin problems, vision issues, sleep apnea, depression, dementia, were uh, more prevalent than uh, one would expect in the general population. But we don't seem to have in our sample these really comparably high rates of diabetes, hypertension, triglycerides, and, and so forth, which I think is worth uh, further investigation. Uh, they seem to have good access to primary care physicians, dentists, um, but they don't always seem to be getting the routine cancer screenings that one would expect. And the rates of cancer I don't think we know for sure what that, that is yet from our sample, but I think it's certainly worth uh, continuing to investigate. All right. Thank you.